How are you, Busher? Quite festive, as you can tell by the hat. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't going to say anything. I was just going to let it hang. Um, I just sort of sit on the counter and figured it'd be a good look. For yeah, no, you, you look you look very good. You look very Meldrum esque. Get me a gig on fucking Yellowstone or something, <laughs> surely. <laughs> um, here we are recording a potty for first time in a while. Actually, we had the nightmare one in between. I don't think we did one in between then. Um, yeah, we did the pre-drafty. Yeah, the pre-draft one. Yeah, so we're going back a few weeks now. Um, it's uh, to be honest, I haven't been making too many videos in general over the last four it's weeks. Season, you've got to take these times off when you can. Yeah, I crashed pretty hard right before the draft in terms of my motivation. So uh, um, we did the bare minimum, but we did the the two day stream for the draft. Yep, it was a good couple of days. Yeah, so we we had a you know there's a fair bit of content in that, yep. so that sort of justifies Including our me twerking when a we little took bit. Matthew oh my Johnson god, pick yeah. twenty one. <laughs> Working for I Johnson was the hashtag there. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, it was it was good fun, and then yeah, just you know, been busy and exhausted, yeah. frankly. So yeah. um, that's why it's a bit of a delayed onset little uh, podcast that we're doing today. So it was a lengthy draft that we watched. Oh no yeah, pun intended. Um, what did you feel about the the draft as a spectacle in the whole? I think they in the whole. <laughs> I mean, on the whole. <laughs> probably spend a bit too much time trying to milk a broadcast i think there was times where the pigs and stuff are in but they've sort of mm. pushed them back to get their full five minutes so they can talk about how pig 72 grew up on a farm or whatever yeah yeah i it was it was pretty painful to be honest so mm. the first night um it's it is kind of an interesting concept having it spread over two nights and the first night was just so dragged out like it took two hours to get through 20 picks and i don't mind that when it's the first 20 picks and there's some sort of intrigue around having it over two days but frankly i think it could have been one day for sure but the most frustrating part was that on the second day each club still had five minutes to pick yeah, and five minutes on the second day is ridiculous it is ridiculous i think they, they definitely used to stagger it so that you had like more minutes in the first round than yeah. the second like i'm pretty sure that was the case i'm sure it used to be like two minutes on the clock yeah, which is reasonable by for like a drafting perspective and a broadcast perspective mm. like it's a you have teams first pick generally in the first round so mm. you want that extra diligence and there's yeah. more talent to evaluate once you're in the second and third rounds your big boards should be a bit more clearer that's very true do you, I, I don't know it's very easy for us to say when we're not there but I don't feel like you need two minutes, five minutes rather to take a yeah. pick in the third round. You yeah. know? And I'm then, sure the clubs probably appreciate the extra time. Like yeah. in there, like for the sake of a few minutes for them, it's probably they're happy right. with it. But from the spectators' perspective, it sucks ass. Yeah, but it's uh, yeah, it's an interesting one. Even like on the first night when pick one is on the board and yeah. North Melbourne, like it goes right almost to the last like. I can't remember how long, but it, they took almost the full five minutes. But it's, it's especially obviously when their list managers come out on like trade radio and pretty much said they're taking Horn Francis for months. Well, yeah, well they they turned down a trade offer of seven, fifteen, twenty six, and Callum Coleman Jones. I think it was. So if you're not really going to get any better offers than that, so my belief, I guess, what I'm more going at is I think North Melbourne had their pick ready to go one second in, and then the yeah. broadcast decided to leave the five minutes going so that they, yeah. like the commentators, can have their yarn and yeah. stuff yeah, like that. Kevin so, Cheney's day in the sun. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was good for our stream. We got a bit of watch time through yeah. a longer draft, but uh, I think it could have could have really benefited from just being one day especially with the lack of trades on day two because uh, there, there was more time for negotiation but at the end of the day like Fremantle held the first pick uh the second day that didn't get uh, traded and nor did several other picks after that I think so. I would have been interested to see what happened with our first pick the second day if Johnson wasn't available mm. would have been interesting as a side to see if we would have been more open to a deal but yeah do you think who do you think you might have taken if we'd kept it and Johnson wasn't there mm. I'd uh, my suspicion was something like a go to or yeah, something go to like makes sense yeah, yeah. Um, it was quite an uneventful draft in comparison to last year. Remember last year, Toomey got a bit of a uh, bit of criticism, I guess, because he, he normally his thing is predicting the draft and his phantom yeah. draft. He usually nails the top ten or gets pretty close. Yeah, twenty twenty, it all went haywire for him because uh, Will Phillips got picked at, by North Melbourne, which was something that no one expected. And I think that's the earliest draft surprise I've ever seen. To uh, be honest, mostly most of the time you've got a good handle of who's going to go where. The first five or six, yeah, pretty written down. That's right. Whereas this year, I think he, he I think he had the first dozen. Uh, uh, when you maybe take out the fact that the Eagles traded down to get Chesser because we uh, traded out of that top twelve, you can't uh, really predict that. But I think uh, in terms of the names, he certainly got like the first eleven right. So uh, um, he did pretty well. How did you feel about Fremantle's approach before we talk more broadly about the draft? With I was kids? quite happy with the way we went. Like my thing going in, because I've come around on Amos a bit. Like since we 
taken him. I've watched more tape and stuff. I'm happier with that pick than I was at the time. Interesting. My initial strategy was get... Because I was more worried about Johnson not being available when I really rated him, so I wanted Erasmus and Johnson. But mm. the way it worked out, we got all three anyway. Yeah. So <laughs> the club knew more than me and knew Amos and Erasmus weren't the two to slide. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, I, yeah, I don't know even know if they would have expected Johnson to go that quite that far. But um, I think they would have just deemed Erasmus slightly better, yeah. better available. And yeah. I would probably have agreed with that. And physically, I'd think Erasmus offers more like athleticism and that sort of yeah. stuff. Like they already shown footage of have him and Brayshaw. Like he was matching Brayshaw in a sprinting drill until one. He took one misstep. Basically. Oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. He uh, he lo- looks like a the sort of midfielder you don't really have one of you know yeah, like someone who can really genuinely play forward i feel like that's yeah, something that tracker type yeah that's right um whereas johnson i feel like is a little bit more replaceable so if, if you just more pick like, between like, the two. like with monday sort of thing yeah that's true that's true um who probably develop a inside game more strongly as he gets older and bigger yeah. and stuff like that because he's quite lightly built but um so but going back to the amos thing like you despite Fremantle needing a key forward you weren't necessarily sold on like, him it's one of those think. things that felt like going into the draft it was just like one of those good but not great sort of prospects it still mm. probably is the case but the more i think about it, the more we just need that steady dependable accurate mainly key forward which is what he brings in spades so yeah. even if he doesn't turn into the next buddy franklin mm. he's still going to be a good pillar of our forward line something reliable something consistent yeah is i think the thing is with that is i i remember when we picked up oscar allen i feel like you could have made the same criticisms about him um pre-draft that he was probably just not quite that you know next buddy franklin yeah. is he quite a true key because of his size yeah. whereas amos it's more his playing style but when you when he's kicking goals like he is and he's prodigious i think there's a chance he ends up another sort of player like that. Do you know what I mean? That's the best case scenario. But um, just to give you a glimmer of hope. Yeah, I'm a lot more optimistic. After we took him, I became more optimistic, Mm. that's for sure. Yeah. But this was also probably a combination of the fact I was higher on some other key prospects that could have been available with our later pick than other people. True. You were more of a Jack Williams man, weren't you? Even a buddy JVR, he almost slid to that pick. True. He almost slid. Yeah. That's true. Like, that, that was my pretense. I was sort of happy with JVR as the likely consolation. Mm. That was risky, yeah. though. I, I feel like him getting through to 21 was always a very long shot, yeah. to be honest. It did get close, but, yeah. Um, yeah, there was a few teams in that range who needed a key defender. And I think Sydney overlooked him for Sheldrick. That was, uh, yeah, that that was, was probably one of the biggest surprises. Well, the first big surprise of the draft was Sheldrick going that early when you had a Van Royen yeah. uh, on the board for the Swans who, you know, presumably needed a key position defender and went all midfield. Yeah. Um, and Fremantle's off-season as a whole, getting um, Will Brodie and, and Clark in as well? Yeah, I was very happy with that whole thing. Like, the Clark deal was about, right, if we traded that 19 for Clark, I wouldn't have been happy. Yeah. And I was very happy getting the 19 in the Will Brodie deal because we've got the cap space to burn, lose and chair up. We might as well take mm. a flyer on a former top 10 pick that could provide us a point of difference in our midfield if it pans out. Being gifted pick 19. Exactly. Like, Gold Coast are just a rabble, aren't they? <laughs> they really are a rabble. Yeah. We'll talk a bit about the Hugh Greenwood situation a little bit later on, but uh, that that... That they've just been could be the nails in the coffin for a trip to Tassie. <laughs> a few of these moves. Oh, maybe, maybe. I don't think so, but yeah, I don't know. I don't yeah. think we're there quite at that point yet. Yeah. But um, they've made enough positive steps to keep those wolves from the door. I think for sure, even it's just, with some mistakes. It's just uh, you know, some of the trade decisions over the last few years. So uh, both involving our club. So pick two for Lockie Weller, which yeah. became Andrew Brayshaw. How much better would Andrew Brayshaw be at, at Gold Coast um, rather than... I mean, Lockie Well is all right, but, mm. you know, pick two is pick two. Yeah. Uh, and then with the, the that same year, in fact, they traded... Was that the year where you flipped them a bunch of yeah, shitload of 20s? It was like four second rounders for our future first, and we ended up winning the flag, and Gold Coast... Uh, don't think they won the spoon, but it might have come second last. Yeah, so, yeah, so it was ended up a two-pick da- downgrade for three picks in the 20s. We got Liam Ryan and Oscar Allen. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was... Who was the other pick? It was Ainsworth, wasn't it? Uh, there was Petrocelli in oh, there, Petch, and, yeah, uh, Petch, and Ainsworth. I, I can't remember. One of those picks was our own to begin with, but yeah. either way, it was... Uh, it was a very good, good trade. Um, and it was just one that's nonsensical from Gold Coast perspective. And I guess we can actually just talk about the Hugh Green- Greenwood situation now. What did, yeah. you, uh, what did you make of it? So for those who uh, maybe didn't follow it so closely, uh, nor, uh, sorry, Gold Coast were able to, or had to delist uh, one of their players for the sake of making a list change. Uh, and then we're going to redraft him on the same contract. Uh, but it would count as a list change. The only risk for that was that a pl- another team could sign him, which... 
ge- generally doesn't happen. It's kind of an unprecedented thing. There's a bit of a unspoken rule in the AFL where you don't sort of take each other's delistings if you commit to taking that yeah. player later. But this is an unexpected one where Hugh Green was the best 22 player mm. and it was really just them playing funny buggers a little bit. I think bit. it was salary cap I think there was a little bit of salary cap logic because I remember before we did the deal for Will Brody there was that talk about a deal for Hugh Greenwood to North Melbourne for the 19. You're thinking of Darcy McPherson. I had McPherson my bad but yeah. still yeah. The salary cap was an issue but I, I, I believe that Hugh Greenwood's salary was staying the same based on his tweet. Right. So I, I think it was more that they had to register three list changes. Yeah. So delisting Greenwood and uh, another one who escapes me. There's another player that they listed who they're going to take back up, but or did. Yeah. But anyway, long story short, North Melbourne swooped in like 12 hours after yeah. that was reported and took him. What do you think uh, about the ethics of all that? I, I don't mind the proactiveness from North Melbourne. Actually, like if they're will if Gold Coast are willing to do such a manoeuvre with a Hugh Greenwood when they've probably got some mm. scrub on their list they could do the same manoeuvre with and no one would bat an eye. Mm. The fact they tried to do this with Hugh Greenwood, who is someone that there actually is going to be some demand for, yeah, it's stupid on their end and it's smart for North Melbourne, which is a club trying to get themselves back to relevancy, mm. to have the balls and gumption to make moves like this is good for their future prospects, I think. Yeah, I agree. They're sort of the first team to do uh, something of this nature, but at the end of the day, it's a competitive landscape. Like, you've got mm. you to take these opportunities when they come. Exactly. It's one thing when it's a player who's like a project player and, um, you know, he wants to stay at his club, but at the end of the day, North Melbourne courted Hugh Greenwood, so it's as much as a Hugh Greenwood's yeah. call as anyone. I guess, if anything, you, you could almost sort of judge Greenwood a little bit. Do you mm. think that's fair? Well, because he did tweet out saying, yeah, it's all bullshit saying it got right. post two days later. Yeah, he made himself look a little silly with that tweet. He's yeah. like, you're all idiots for thinking I might get picked up by someone else. And, and he, has he a bit agrees of a, to a deal. He has a bit of a history of this as well. Before he even joined the AFL, he had a deal signed, sealed and delivered with the Perth Wildcats Is to that right? come play for us. And then about a week later, went, nope, get stuffed. I'm going to give AFL credit and <laughs> sign with Adelaide. Yeah, right. Interesting. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. I don't know. I just feel like he's got a, a contractual agreement, technically not legally, the, yeah. with the Gold Coast Suns, but to leave for a pay rise straight away. He's well within his rights, but I feel like I would be pissed if I was a Gold Coast fan. I think it was a substantial pay rise, though. I think yeah. it was, don't think it was insignificant. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Like, if we're talking, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, then that's a little different, yeah. but, yeah. Still, apparently the one I heard, Cherry took a $125,000 pay cut to leave us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He was very overpaid, Chera, for mm. what he was yeah, at the yeah. time. He was being paid as though he'd hit his peak almost, mm. um, or maybe just you know yeah. just shy of that. So the fact we're paying him that much that early shows as obvious we're yeah. paying on for dear life. Yeah, and... exactly. Shows a real lack of confidence. Uh, I w- I'd be interested to see what Chera was paid versus Brayshaw, who was the better player over yeah. the same period of time. Um, probably more paid yeah, more highly. So, so yeah. um, which is yeah, interesting stuff. Um, We'll get back to our club's approach, West Coast. Um, so West Coast recruited Sam Petrovsky seaton through the trade period uh, and then drafted Chesser. Uh, I think it's Hoff. I've heard people say how, and I've heard them say uh, Hoff, and I think it's Hoff. Yeah. Let's just go with that. Rhett Bazo, Jack Williams, your boy, and Greg Clark. You were saying a little bit before the podcast you thought uh, our approach was a little strange. What, what, well, can you the, elaborate on more that? More the Chesser specifically, yep. like... That trade you did trading down the two picks with Port Adelaide at the time, the second you did, I'm like, yep, that's fucking genius mm. from him. I hated giving you any credit, but that trade was fucking genius. Yeah. But I didn't expect it to be for someone like Chess. I was expecting you to take a Johnson or even a JVR or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can agree. I agree with that because at the time, yeah. you, as you, people would have seen on the live stream, I was like, not Chesser, not Chesser, <laughs> not Slytherin. Eh? Like, he's a good talent. Like, he's a great talent, like, about that sort of mark. But mm. with the question marks and stuff, there was probably more conventional people you could have taken or you could have traded further back mm. and still gotten him. So, uh, on that second point of us not trading further back, uh, I believe it's reported that we, that Brisbane were very keen on Chesser. So, trading much further back would have okay. been, uh, if Chesser was our target, which it appears it was, um, was probably not the right move for us. Um, well, I, that's, that makes it more reasonable if you chose Chess when you had the Intel 15 and 20 yeah, were eyeing him off. That's right. 15, 20 or whatever Brizzy had. Yeah, yeah. It would have been the, one of the next picks. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I've kind of settled in the cold light of day a little bit more. Um, I, I like the move a little bit more. It's just uncharacteristically 
risky. We normally are very conservative with our draft picks West Coast. So to pick up a kid who is a halfback flanker, prospective midfielder when they want to turn him into a midfielder who's played six games in two years um, and battled form and injury, I think, in 2021. He was a top five pick in his 16 era. Though, yeah, that's right. So uh, he was one of those players that had a really strong juniors and we have a history of picking players like that. Uh, and then in the COVID-affected years, uh, obviously it just hasn't quite come on. And injuries as well. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, when you look at it, like what do the Eagles need? Do they need midfielders? But in terms of his skill set versus a Matthew Johnson who I openly or wanted. Or even Hobbs if he didn't trade downs also. Yes. Something to add to that. Well, I was open to Hobbs. But again, if they have intel that Hobbs doesn't want yeah. to leave Victoria, that's that's uh, something I can you know, yeah. get over pretty quickly. Um, but in terms of a Johnson who I openly wanted... At least you can make the argument Chess's upside is he's yeah. got that extreme pace and, and yeah. aggressive points of style difference. and points of difference. So it's a risk, and the Eagles will fall on their sword if this is our first first round pick in four years since your last one, Jared Brander. Brander and Venables were the two before that, so it's been a, since Duggan since we actually nailed can't a blame you for Venables though. You can't blame no, the Eagles no, for right. that panned out. No, but it's just more like seven years since we've got a first round pick who's still on the list. Okay. So it was just an important one to get right. So it was just uncharacteristically ballsy, but I've now settled into thinking. I really hope. I, I really see why they picked him, and uh, I hope with both of my fingers crossed um, that that it turns out uh, it's pretty good. I think we did pretty well getting Bazo yeah, as I well. Like Bazo um, and Greg Clark, I was really happy with. So that that's a real happy story of a kid who. Uh, I don't know if you you wouldn't have watched his press conference when he got drafted, but it was really really right. impressive. Just spoke like a guy who. He seems like one of those, he was the captain of like WA state team as a juniors the mm-hmm. year he didn't get drafted. Then he spent lots of years at Subiaco, which is a club where he would have had to do a bit of this stuff. That's right. He's a good guy for you guys to pick up to just walk in while you put that time in the chair, sir. Mm-hmm. While those sort of guys, like he's a guy that can just give you production in the midfield until your prospects are good to go. That's right. So for those who don't know too much about him, he was, yeah, as you say, like probably a top 15 prospect for most of the year in the 2015 draft. Uh, and then went completely undrafted that year. And he says that uh, he's kind of glad that didn't happen because he was quite, uh, to paraphrase, a little bit up himself and kind of mm. would have believed the hype. And uh, he's, he's toiled the hard way, played for Subiaco, who's considered probably the best um, club. But, but the best team outside of the AFL, a lot of people are saying, in terms yeah. of how dominant they are. Um, and you look at the condition their players are in, it's just an incredible organisation, yeah. Subiaco. Schofield. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And now Schofield's at West Coast exactly. as well, so there's that connection. But... Long story short, he's toiled really hard and he's got another opportunity uh, at West Coast and at 24 years old. He's still pretty young. Yeah, I was going to say. So, it, like, you know, you got Redden and Shuey retiring, you know, maybe in three years. Op- optimistically, probably Shuey, I think, will have three, I'm hoping. Uh, but either way, obviously, with uh, with the list profile, it's a, it's a really good one. But also just from a... Because there's not many in that 24 to like 28 on the Eagles Correct. list, really. Yeah, it's just Sheed, I think, yeah. in that range, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, it's a massive gap in our list. And oh, Petrovsky seaton now yep. uh, as well. That, yep. um, but, yeah, enough about the Eagles. I was generally quite happy. I think Hoff is another one I'm really happy with uh, in terms of his highlights package. Okay. Like, I don't know much about him other than that, but play, cracked a waffle league debut in his first season playing, you know, serious football. Because so. he was another one trekking from down south every week, wasn't he? He's from Harvey. Yeah. yeah, so not too far from where I am, I'm a Bunbury boy, uh, and then just started taking footy seriously, I think, this year. Like, he didn't have any intention of trying to get drafted, oh, yeah. and then within 12 months, he's on an AFL list in yeah. the second round. It's just amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so jealous of people with that kind of talent. Oh, yeah. Um, but we'll talk about more about the draft generally. Uh, some draft steals that come to mind. Who do you? Who did you think on the night were like, uh, that, guy, that guy's going way later than I expected, or do you think that guy will go really well for that team? First name that came to mind there is Ben Hobbs, really. Yeah. Essendon would have been rubbing their hands together when he was there at pick 13. Mm-hmm. Just sitting there going, yeah, beautiful inside mid. Even though he's probably a little similar to some of their other current midfielders, they might have wanted more of a point of difference, taller midfielder, but they rated Hobbs as a talent and... He's more talented than pick 13, mm. probably suggests. He's been ca- compared to a bit of a Joel Selwood type. So I think that right. it does present something different in their midfield with Parrish and, and Merritt. Um, I guess they're a little and more Shield. outside, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, he's just so inside and, right. and brutal. Still um, a little nuggety as a whole, their midfield. But, mm. but probably... Even Archie Perkins might eventually go in there in a few years. He's a bit bigger body. True, but again, another player who can sort of play on the outside and play forward to centre and quite explosive. Right. So you can just probably in theory play them all together yeah. so I agree that's a really great pick and Toomey ranked him fifth in yeah. his November Phantom guide and Nightmare was a little uh, 
blasé on him. It's not the right word, but uh, I think he had him in the teens. But either way, pick 13 was good value and maybe a play that uh, benefited from some non-Victorian teams picking that range. So Fremantle considered him, yeah. ended up going with Erasmus. May have just thought he was better, yeah. quite possibly, but there's a little bit of talk that he didn't want to leave um, Victoria. There are those whispers. They surprised me a little because he's Vic country, but... Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that's Still, not necessarily yeah. uh, the be-all and end-all. Like, a lot of kids just want to yeah. play in Melbourne. Yeah. And there's there's players that go to, want to go play in Melbourne despite being West Australian. Yeah. Mind you, Jordan Clark was one of those. <laughs> um, but, yeah, anyway, uh, that was a good shout. Um, I, we talked about Rhett Bazo. When an interesting one, Mick Ablett, uh, who is West Australian-based, had yeah. him in his top ten. So I don't know if I can claim that, but that is a really high praise uh, for... There was a bit of talk... Mick Ablett's a good talent. Yeah. Assessment, assessor of talent. That's right. He was in the... West Australian Football Commission. I don't know what exactly exactly his I role know Lenny was. had a lot to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so he's well and truly involved in that West Australian team, which might make him a little bit biased because yeah. it's, uh, it, you know, it's Bazo's West Australian, but presumably had him higher than Van Roy in, in his yeah. ranks, you'd think. Um, but Toomey had him at 32, so mixed uh, mixed reviews there. But Arlo Draper was another one. Yeah. Uh, it was a player that I was like, if we take him at 12, I'm happy with that. Toomey and Nightmare both ranked him in the teens. I think Nightmare had him 17. Can't remember where Toomey had him, but around that range as well. He ended up going like pick 45. So Collingwood, who had no picks after Dacos. They have a bit of a history of getting guys like that, Collingwood, in recent drafts with later picks. Later. Like uh, the sliders. Sliders, do yeah. they? Arlo Draper. There's a couple of others they got a few years ago. Forget which draft. There's one with okay, Took a couple of guys in the 40s where you're like, yeah, they're lucky to get those guys. Yeah, okay. okay. I don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, Zach Taylor uh, was one that Nightmare had 12th and Toomey had 26 and he went at pick yeah. 44 to Adelaide. Um, Blake Howes was an interesting one. He was uh, taken with pick 39 by Melbourne, but uh, according to the reports, no idea if it's true, but Melbourne contemplated him at pick 19. So they actually waited 20 picks and got him with their second pick. <laughs> GWS considered him at pick 15, according to Toomey, and Toomey ranked him 15th in his own ranking. So to get him at pick 39 is a massive bargain. Um, it just shows how like diverse some of these rankings can be. Because you know? like, The thing is, most people go off like two different people's big boys, like Toomey's and Nightmares, whereas yeah. clubs just have their own with their own yeah. scouts who are actually watching every game. So like, they see stuff entirely differently. Exactly, and that's why you know Kai Lohman um, yep. was a player who was taken, was it the last pick of the yeah, first nine? Um, Sydney apparently considered him with the pick before, two picks before. Um, but yeah. you know, looking at the media and everyone's sort of draft boards before that, he was not considered to yeah. go that early at all, including by Toomey. So uh, yeah, it just goes to show that um, we don't really know as much as we think we do. Um, Tyler Sonzi as well Toomey ranked 16 He went pick 28 So Richmond did particularly well uh, With that sort of I was slider. surprised the Hawks Didn't take him with one of theirs In the 20s mm, Yeah like again we Hill kind of connection. just Yeah I was going to say We make the Box Hill connection But again you'd, you would kind of hope Your team doesn't just pick players Based on where they're from But it might also give them More information The fact that he's played there And they might see some stuff They don't like as much That's a fair point So it might be oversaturation Of Sonzi Where they see more of the flaws Than most yeah. people probably see And have written him accordingly Yeah I think Somebody said that about West Coast and Powell Pepper because yeah. we were very close to him before he got drafted and overlooked him. But yeah. uh, that's just an Eagles-related tangent, as I love to do. We can talk about some other teams that we think did particularly well. Um, there's, there's always a bit of chatter after the draft, you know, of winners and losers. I think that's completely silly. Like, there's no way you can assess how a team's lost. You can certainly make opinions about, you know, the, uh, based on my opinions of these yeah. players, I think this team did well. Yeah, but yeah. trying to assert that a team's lost the draft, yeah. I think is a much harder thing to yep. do when... You're more yeah. likely going to shoot yourself in the foot than make yourself look like a hero doing that one. That's, that's right. Sure. But what we can do is just sort of look at um, you know where teams were so, or players were sort of ranked uh, as a consensus and the teams that ended up you know doing well in getting value. Uh, one I'd like to nominate is North Melbourne. I think I think yeah. this is it, when you look at their whole off season uh, like cumulatively. I didn't say that word correctly. <laughs> but to add Hugh Greenwood uh, right before the draft. Callum Conwin Jones for a pretty pretty decent price, um, considering I think he's a pretty talented player. Um, so they got some midfield established talent uh, and depth, and Conwin Jones is a key forward which they needed. And then you add Jason Horn Francis to that, who's potentially a marquee yeah. player for him. Goda slides to pick yeah. twenty two, and then some uh, other players in Curtis Bergman. I think it's uh, Miles Bergman's brother. Yep, yeah, it is. And son of Glenn Archer. But also, in the mid-season draft, they took a kid called Jake Edwards, who apparently would have gone in the teens, they reckon, in this year's draft had he nominated. Right. But he because he was an overager, yeah. um, he got taken mid-season. So that's a massive haul. Did there end up being many overagers in this draft? 
as a quick aside? Um, okay, so Greg Clark comes to mind. Leek Lear was an overager. Yeah. Uh, well, not as many as I would have thought. Yeah. I thought there would have been a few from like guys like last year that like, mm. sort of were pushing it, but because of the smaller draft. Yeah, there would have been more than that, and I'm just uh, I've gone blank a little bit, but I, I did, none come to mind. Um, yeah, I can't. Think yeah, of. there was a bit of talk that you know Bailey Rogers might get picked up, um, but because we're, we're in West Australia, we hear yeah. that noise a lot more. But it, Nightmare was onto him as well. Um, I don't know. I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll think of some as we as we go. But you're right. In terms of uh, mature ages generally, I don't think it was a particularly strong year yeah. for him. Um, Greg Clark was almost the last pick of the draft. Even think, like so. those 19 year olds, just like the Jack Avery age group. True. Sort of, True. I was expecting a couple more guys from that sort of age would have had that extra year to yeah. float their resume. That's a fair point. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. There's, there's going to be a train on period now as well, which they did last year. Do you remember when yeah. we spoke to Jack? He was going to do a train on with the. Uh, I don't know where he trained on. Uh, um, but. Uh, yeah, so I think there's a series of like the Eagles Actually, just clubs didn't have roster spots, like because you guys have a roster spot, so you you yeah. a few train ons. We just didn't take a rookie pick, yeah. which is weird. Which so I think it's because you it. figured you'd take the summer to try them out rather than just take someone. Yeah, that's right. Um, which which makes sense. Yeah. Um, I think we've got uh, let's go on a tangent. We got about three players with us, maybe four. Str- uh, Stranatica from Fremantle yeah. was training with us as well. Yeah, plus all that. Um, but Shepard might be retiring any day yeah. now. So that, yeah, anyway. Um, but we'll get back to North Melbourne. <laughs> Um, or maybe we'll talk about another team that you think did particularly well. It's one of those ones, one team that comes to mind, but sort of like, I don't know how much credit I can give them for it, is Richmond. They just sort of had the quantity of picks and they yeah. didn't really stuff them up. Yeah. So you've got to give them credit for not stuffing up the picks they had from what we know about the talent <laughs> to this point. That's true. Um, yeah, it, it's a tough one when you assess you know who won the draft, but uh, you know Fremantle always can... Uh, considered in these calculations but they often also have really good picks yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I do think they did well but I just mean you, you need to take that in con- we got lucky with Johnson well. fall under 21 that's a yeah I mean I think you guys draft very well I'll, yeah. ju- I'll just say I'm not, yeah. that wasn't a pot shot at Fremantle but um, but I just mean it's yeah. an example of a team that always Where the circumstances just set them up to have a good draft yeah that's right and, and it's often us because we're always trading away fucking existing yeah. talent for picks <laughs> exactly uh, but a closer look at Richmond they took Gibkiss they took Tom Brown Sonzi, Sam Banks from Tasmania, and Judson Clark, the small forward. If I had to offer any criticism of this, it was just the lack of midfield um, replenishment, and it's not necessarily uh, a a strong criticism. It's just that that was sort of reported like their biggest need, you know, with an aging midfield that's probably not a very strong one to begin with. I know a lot of the Richmond fans wanted Hobbs. Mm. uh, Well, actually, I've got a note here. So they offered 17, 28, and a future second to West Coast for 12 uh, and a future second. So it was basically 17 and 28 uh, for 12, and then a swap for future seconds, um, on the basis that the Eagles would have uh, access to Hobbs. We ended up doing the deal with Port Adelaide anyway, um, because I think Port Adelaide just beat them to the punch. But that was Richmond's bold attempt to try and get back into the draft to get Hobbs. So if they'd gone uh, Gibkus and... Uh, they would have got Gibkus and Hobbs in that scenario and probably missed out on Sonzi and Brown. Yeah. so instead they get Sonzi and Brown, two players, which, you know, two players instead of one, is, is it's hard yeah. to argue that they've, um, that they've was, missed out. That but. was ultimately my thing, because when there was the rumours of Freo trying to trade hard for Horn Francis, I was sort of like two potential eight kids instead of mm. one most likely elite kid. Yeah, I one. think historically, yeah. like you, you have to run the numbers, but I feel like two picks in the top ten versus one, even if it is pick one, yeah. historically, like how often is pick one the best player in a draft? Almost never. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's. I think it's a strong argument to be made that more bites at the apple in that sort of first round is yeah. is a better th- hand to have than necessarily pick one. Which is why I was baffled by Richmond's massive offer for pick one, and I was I raised that with Nightmare, and he's like, "No, nah, I think um, I think it's not enough for Jason Horn Francis." So <laughs> you know, there you go. Maybe he turns out to be a danger field player, and yeah. I am proven wrong. But um, that was just my. Original thinking, uh, but they got their their man in the uh, key key defender and a running defender as well. So they replace yeah. uh, Hawley and Asprey in, in one draft there, and um, I think they'll still need to look at the midfield soon. But uh, overall, on talent, you yeah. have to say they did pretty well. Um, anyone else come to mind that has done pretty well? Ooh. I think you can put Fremantle in there. Yeah, like, yeah, give us the credit. We did everything right. Yeah, 
Um, I, I'll give us a little tick for our trade because that we trade traded. was fucking genius. So we got basically a, a free second rounder for trading down to get Chesser. Uh, Port Adelaide, I uh, conversely traded a second rounder just to make sure they got Sin ahead of Essendon. Right. Um, so, you know, only time will tell whether that was a wise move, but it might end up not being... Uh, in terms of value, That's a, it's a yeah. poor deal for Port Adelaide, mm-hmm. but if they got their man, then, you know... That's the way you go got to look at drafts ultimately. You've got mm-hmm. your man, you've got mm-hmm. who you want, you got yeah. to do what you can to get him. Yeah, but unless... Unless hypothetically much, Chester yeah. becomes a better player than Sin and then, then yeah. it looks silly but um, but either way the Eagles scoring a free second rounder um, give him a little tick for that I think GWS are worth acknowledging here mm-hmm. um, correct me if I'm wrong they didn't really lose too many players of note this offseason which is a regular theme for them so they lost yeah, Finn Layson uh, uh, they nearly lost um, Bobby. Bobby Hill yeah. And they failed to acquire some Hawthorne veterans that they were linked to. But uh, either the, other than that, you know, compared to last year where they lost six best 22 players. I think players. it was more they failed to peg the interest of the Hawthorne veterans. I think Hawthorne were interested, it's just the yes. veterans on Hawthorne weren't so interested in the move. Yeah, that's right. And I don't think it was on the whole uh, earth-shattering for GWS if they've picked up a Finn Callahan, which yeah. is probably the player they would miss out on to, to acquire some of those players. Um, well, allegedly, anyway. Uh, then I think they've done pretty well. So they've got Callahan, Aaliyah, um, at pick 15. So they got their, their key back option. Told that just as it happened. Yes, yes, he did. Josh Fay is an academy player, so a running defender. And they picked up Jared Brander as a delisted free agent as well. So uh, another team that needs forward targets. And Brander's probably a little bit... He could slide into Finlayson's like third tall league yeah, role. There is some upside there. I mean, he didn't really set the world on fire, but he wasn't poor for West Coast. He, mm. he just wasn't the amazing. The still there. Like similar to the Hogan situation, the talents. There, yeah, yeah. They I mean, in the right situation. Hogan's, I'd say, Hogan's more talented. More mental, yeah, Hogan's Brander's done a lot more. more situation. Yes, Hogan's done a lot more at AFL level yeah. than, than Brander. But either way, it's just a good value pickup for in a position of need. Apparently, they'd offered pick fifteen and a future first round pick for Richmond to Richmond for pick nine. So that's a pretty generous deal. Um, and maybe that was, they much preferred Gibkiss over it. Yeah. That, that's what's being reported. Uh, but Richmond also wanted Gibkiss, yeah. so they were trading with the wrong team there. Both Port Adelaide and West Coast had considered offering their future round, first round pick to the Giants for pick 15, um, dependent on player availability. So, we uh, would have been thinking Johnson probably. See, guessing. Toomey su- suggests that we were looking at Goda or Tom Brown, running defender, mm. which would have made me piss my pants. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have no real opinion on Tom Brown, um, other than the fact that we just don't need another running defender. Uh, uh, I think the midfield is what we need. Um, even with Tressa there as well. Yeah. It would have been exciting to trade into the first round, but going into next year with no first round, it would have sucked, I think. Oh, uh, yeah. Mm. But yeah, I love this article uh, that Toomey's put out suggesting all the uh, almost trades that happened because uh, it was pretty uneventful enough in terms of the deals that actually happened. Um, Hawthorne, another team that had early picks and you'd, you'd think probably did pretty well. How did it feel when Jaisa Rong joined Hawthorne? One pick before our next one, I was a bit like... I don't know how good of a prospect he actually would be, but it would have been a nice little fairy tale thing to yeah. get him in with his brother. But I don't know anything about him, to be honest. Yeah, me neither. I think he's a taller forward mid. Yeah, he's like one, he's a bit of a utility, like a 193 yeah. utility, just sort yeah. of sticking wherever you need him, sort of. Yeah. Guy. I feel like Sarong's Caleb, uh, that is, is not the sort of player who would leave as well. I don't think so. Like, Sarong's. I could almost see Sarong being the next captain over Brayshaw, to be honest. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah interesting. Um,. Like, oh. even, like, the stuff Matthew Johnson was saying, like, after the draft, like, after the first night, Caleb Sarong had never met him in his life, never had anything to do with him, sent him a message saying, it's all going to be good, mate. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. I uh, remember seeing Sarong out uh, at Benny's, yeah, um, I've seen him there which is a times. bar here, and I was like, that kid looks about 14, <laughs> and I cannot believe that he just, like, ragged old West Coast in that derby. <laughs> it's yeah, just it's hard crazy, to believe yeah. against like, when you see him in real life, like, he, he looks like a young 18-year-old, yeah. or 19. Well, at the time, he was yeah. probably 19. I can't remember when. It was like a year ago, so. Anyway, just a phenomenal uh-huh. young player. Josh Ward, Sam Butler, and Connor McDonald were Hawthorne's picks, so a bevy of smaller midfielders, uh, which not necessarily a bad thing, but a, a clear type there. Um, and then Sarong as well, who's a taller type. Hawthorne had discussed packaging 23 in a future second round pick to grab Fremantle's pick 21. Um, it was... Sam Mitchell was enamoured with Matt Johnson. That's pretty much consensus, I believe. Oh, really? Yeah. Sam Mitchell specifically? Yeah, apparently Sam Mitchell's frothed him. Interesting. That um apparently the thing. Yeah, apparently the Hawthorne considered him at the pick they took Ward with, so yeah, exactly. by that logic, that makes sense. Um, but the Dockers obviously didn't think that was value. 
Um, which is strange because it's a very good deal. So 23 and a future second for 21. Uh, that's uh, that's a whole extra second rounder next year. But anyway, they just would. I think we rated Johnson higher. Let's just be rated Erasmus and Amos higher. So we took mm. the picks. But when Johnson fell into our laps, we were like, "Holy shit! We can't say no to this." Yeah, that's right. At the risk of putting you on the spot, is there any other team that comes to mind that thought their approach was a little strange? Excuse strange me. Strange approach. Mm. It is a tough one to put you on the spot with. I don't want to like disparage Adelaide, but I think they could have almost tried to go hard. Like I don't know how hard that final offer was to try and pry one from North, mm. but I don't know I if probably... that was ever going to happen. Hey, mm. that's the thing. It's hard to be critical on on that. Uh. Um, but. They picked up a pretty good player in Rochelle yeah. as well. Uh, I think looking at that... So they got Saligo, they got Zach Taylor, and they got um, uh, Rochelle yeah. as well. Uh, as a mix, it's it's a very small influx mm. of midfielders, isn't yeah. it? Um, so I, I think that's probably one thing they'll lack going forward. I'm not criticising this yeah. year's draft for them, but the in terms of the, what their future team looks like, yeah. they probably need that taller... And especially like... A, mid- and I still don't know if they have that A-grade midfielder. Like Rochelle yeah. could be an A-grade half mm. forward that goes into the midfield but I don't yeah. know if he can be an A grade pure midfielder Yeah, which has been my thing on them for a while saying they need that A grade midfielder I agree but although it, uh, I'm, I, th- I think they took the right player Excuse yeah me. he I was the best probably the best available yeah, I'm I, I not think begrudging they them for the selection it's just yeah, doesn't feel like it's going to help them as much as you'd hope not in that term. specific yeah not in that specific way but I, th- I, I just think it's going to be a focus for them going forward like I, yeah. I think they've got some good young Midfielders like you got like Chase Jones and Schonberg as well. I think yeah, is a McHenry, really likely type. McKee's is still a young guy. Uh, McHenry as well as a kind of like pressure forward as well. Uh, but but what they could look to add is a you know an Archie Perkins type right. or a Nick Cox type. I've just gone right. straight to two Essendon <laughs> players. But um, uh, that, that that sort of type is what I think and they'd need in the future. I've just thought of a caveat on that as well. I've, I've, cause I think they are gearing up to make moves on Lukosius and Rankin next year. I think yeah. the thing. So yeah, they probably based some of their strategy off those possibilities mm, that's true yeah, that, that would be yeah. big gets yeah. uh, I, I, surely they couldn't land both of them but, be hard um, to get both yeah I'd, I'd be definitely on Lukosius out of the two if yeah. I had to choose but that would be big for Adelaide's rebuild if they could land one of those two players oh yeah um, I, I'll probably highlight Sydney as a team that I just thought it was a little unexpected the way they approached the draft so I think we will well not we will but uh, I certainly felt a key defender was probably going to be on their radar if one was available and they overlooked Van Roy and, and took Angus Sheldrick Angus Sheldrick looks like a pretty good young player to uh, be honest but uh, to pick three midfielders in Sheldrick Matthew Roberts and Corey Warner it was just uh, an unexpected mix I thought they would go for a bit more variety uh, the, the midfield I feel like the young midfield is pretty good eh? yeah do you not think so like, like well, they could, probably could use one more person yeah like, because the thing is, you've got your JPKs, your Luke Parkers, who that's true. are closer to the end than the beginning. So that's true. You're going to need but to replace them. That's true. Like Warner's more outside. They probably need that winger, just, yeah. especially with Jordan Dawson leaving, because he played a bit of that wingy into the lead up, link mm. up to type of guy. That's true. I mean, I really like the Warner pick. I think right. uh, there's a nice sort of romantic uh, yeah, pick the there romantic with um, the Warner brothers being re- reunited. <laughs> Warner brothers. Um, and they're both quite opposite to each other. Uh, in isolation, I like those picks, but. Uh, I don't know. I just yeah. thought I thought I'd go for a different blend, and it really depends, I guess, how your Goldens and your Campbells project. Like, does yeah. Campbell become more of a half forward, or is he like a running defender with his skills, or is uh, he a midfielder? Um, because that changes things. If he's not a midfielder, then they've got more need for a midfielder. Yeah. Uh, same thing with Golden. But um, yeah, interesting. But I think Sheldrick is a really good player. Lucky Neil of this draft, you could say. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, he's a, he's a really thick boy, and he did a job on Horn Francis in a yeah. state game, so he's. Got the chops because Juan yeah. Francis is clearly AFL standard already. Yeah, that fiercely competitive type of player um, who wins games, like he won that game for WA, they're uh, few and far between. So I actually think yeah. he's a bit of an underrated talent. I, I'm okay with the range he was taken at. It was just uh, just the mix of Sydney, the players that Sydney brought in was uh, not what I expected. Didn't Nightmare but. have him really high, Sheldon? Yeah, he did. I can't remember exactly where. It was close to it was the top the 10. Teams, yeah. It was close to the top 10. Yeah. Um, he loves his competitive types, um, yeah. Nightmare, I've noticed. The midfielders, he always ranks them highly on how well they win the contested ball. Right. Um, and Sheldrick certainly ticks that box. Rising star predictions. Let's have a little crack at based on um, what we know, which is very little. <laughs> I'm going to go with Nick Dacos. Dacos, yeah. yeah. I could see that happening. I think the media will hop on his wagon more than they'll hop on Juan yeah. Francis because Collingwood's the big Melbourne club. Mm. 
the family name. You feel like he can play early, yeah. but he's also missed a lot of football as compared okay. to a Horn Francis who's been playing against yeah. men for a couple of years now. Like, I'm purely basing that on media and yeah. all that bullshit rather than the yeah. deserving one. Horn Francis will probably be the deserving rising star. Yeah. Uh, this is just us spitballing, but yeah. uh, Dacos, really good inside and outside. Um, they say that he would, that he was looked for a little bit, which might have led to a bit of stat padding. That came yeah. from Nightmare for Collingwood fan. Um, yeah. It's not a criticism, but that might be why he's getting 36 and 2. Yeah. yeah. Um, Horn Francis is probably just a little bit more experienced, though, yeah. frankly. Um, and I, I think North Melbourne are going to be better than Collingwood. I'd agree and, with that. and if you take out, you know, Pendlebury's just uh, come out with a fracture. Um, Dugowie, who knows if he's going to play another game for yeah. him. That team's looking very exposed. I think Collingwood will really struggle. Um, and I think I think Horn Francis has a is a better chance. But again, you know, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I think I tipped Ugle Hagen or Raul last year and it was nowhere yeah. near him. Um, Luke Jackson one, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what are some other nominations you reckon for rising? Yeah. Ooh. So key position players rarely win it. Luke yeah, Jackson was a second year player and an exception to the rule. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wasn't going big on this one for sure. I was probably sort of thinking Ward maybe. I think Ward is considered quite ready made in terms yeah. of his skill set, can play inside and out, and therefore doesn't rely on building a contested game to impact yeah. at AFL level. Uh, and he'll probably play round one. So uh, Ben Hobbs is another one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Hobbsy. Who, Even Rochelle. Yeah, Rochelle as well. Previous remarks, so you could bob up for those big goal games with mm. twenty touches. Yep. Do it reasonably consistently. A lot depends on how good Adelaide are next yeah. year. Because if you're a four to centre player with limited yeah. supply, it's going to be hard for him. It probably but if, feels a bit like picking Rankin for it a few years back. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's true. That's true. Um, my uh, dark horse here is Sheldrick. Yeah. Another player who's just fiercely competitive and I feel like is already physically big enough to play at AFL level yeah. and competitive enough to at least turn a few heads. Whether yeah. he wins it or not, I'm not sure, but I think he'll get a nomination. I've um, got, I've actually, despite everything we just said about Keys, I'm going to go a bit of a dark horse here. Jai Amos. <laughs> Lee Kalir. Lee Kalir. Yes, he will just qualify, I think, on age because he's a couple of years older. Ah. Uh, but I, I think he will qualify. Yeah, I think he's still um, good, yeah. But that's not a bad shout. Because I think he'd slide right into that. But 22 for GWS yeah. is a key back and ready made yeah. so uh, unlike your Gib kisses he's exactly. got two years on him a bit more developed and I yeah. like it not a bad shout and uh, yeah poss- quite possibly going to play some football next year enough about the draft um, we can talk a little bit about the round one fixture release which has come out uh, yeah, I just know we're something. playing Adelaide that's all I know yeah, okay. we'll go through it because yeah. there's a few talking points here I think Carlton Richmond no it's not the debi- it's not the opening game this oh, year fuck yeah you really, you really didn't look at it I assumed it was I <laughs> didn't look at it properly the season opens on Wednesday night Melbourne versus the Bulldogs at MCG Oy. that's that's cool so this is this is uh, worth talking about because it's one of those things that everyone says that the grand final replay should be the opening game the following year that's, yeah. that's what people have been suggesting. Every time Carlton versus Richmond gets announced, they're like, oh, God, that's still on Thursday night, yeah. but it's not the first game of the year. What are your thoughts on having the grand final replay as the opening game? I don't know, because I'd probably... It would be quite deflating for the Bulldogs, I think, because it'll be a bit of a... Especially because there'll be crowds and shit back in Melbourne, so yeah. all the Melbourne fans will be like, oh, this is our first chance to get around our team since they won. Yeah, but it's a chance for revenge. Yeah, you know? There's a narrative there as well. Mm. Um. It, yeah, Wednesday night's a bit weird though. And Wednesday night. Wednesday night fucking That's a bit sucks. fucked to be honest. Yeah. It's good for us because we're not yeah. there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is a high potential that this is going to be one of the biggest home and away attendances ever, yeah. to be honest. Uh, Melbourne and the Bulldogs don't necessarily pull as big a crowd as a Carlton or Richmond. Um, but I think that emotion will get it. Yeah, and just there'll be 100,000 Melbourne fans there just going fucking Yeah, yeah, tonight. this is like the grand final they couldn't go to exactly. in theory. Um, and the Bulldogs fans will feel the same, I think. Um, <laughs> a bit more depressingly. Oh yeah, but the, bit, the yeah. more just like being there. Yeah. It, I, I think I think they'll still they'll still get get around it to be honest. Oh, yeah. um, other than the fact that it's on Wednesday night, but yeah, it's great. I think I think the biggest factor in it is just uh, purely because you know Melbourne's had such a rough time of it over the last two years. So to having this like grand slam weekend of football with the grand final replay at the MCG as the opening game of the season, uh, I think I think it's a nice sort of like little romantic fixture that probably won't last next year. I think we'll go back to Carlton Richmond next year. Boo! I don't think it's going to be a regular marquee sort of game uh, because people will already go to that game, the mm, grand final exactly. replay. You want to have it early? Whereas maybe who goes to two. Carlton games? 
people Carlton and Richmond still sell out <laughs> yeah. even when Carlton getting annihilated. But mind you, they've actually done pretty well in that fixture over the last few years. But, uh. Um, so that is the Thursday night, and you'd have to say we say it every year, but this is best, Carlton's best chance to beat Richmond in a long time. <laughs> and the, you could actually make the argument that uh, that could be the case. They uh. could be better than them. When you look at uh. when, when Richmond are much better than Carlton, they still do well in this fixture. Yeah. And I feel like Richmond, I still think Richmond will be around the mark next mm. year, but it's a lot yeah. closer than it used to be. Uh, St Kilda versus Collingwood on Friday night. That's going to be a snooze fest, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. Um, Geelong versus Essendon, the G, the Sydney, uh, the Sydney derby in round one. That's spicy. Uh, that is that is cool because, uh, interestingly, I think the Swans had requested a round one home game because Buddy Franklin might Once get his thousand. thousand. Yeah, yeah. But it's probably better tactic to have it in round two because what are the chances? I think he needs to kick four. Yeah. Um, but either way, it'll be in Sydney, so they can't really lose. Yeah. So I'll have Sydney fans there. Brisbane versus Port at the Gabba will be a great fixture between two really good teams. Yeah. And then the Sunday blockbuster fest, Hawthorne versus North Melbourne, Adelaide versus Fremantle, and West Coast versus Gold Coast on Sunday night. <laughs> that is the most putrid Sunday Ooh, of fixtures yeah. of round one I've ever seen, to be honest. Oh, yeah. Um, how confident are you that Fremantle can go to Adelaide and knock them off again? Pretty confident, Yeah, really. I'd be pretty confident, too. To we're, a, we're a team aiming for finals. They're a team aiming to get ready to make mm. finals in a year or two. So They did have a pretty good round one last year. They knocked off Geelong. Yeah. Um, so they might start the season well, but that being said... Uh, there's no reason to not be confident, I think, yeah. from Fremantle's perspective. Um, bo- both of those teams yeah. will be looking to improve next year. Certainly. And I really hope West Coast versus Gold Coast is not close. <laughs> Shouldn't be, especially yeah. here. I'm pretty I've, I'm pretty optimistic about West Coast. So I think we'll play finals. I know, yeah. I know that is now so far against the grain of opinion, and I understand that, and I'm not going to try and argue that uh, harshly, but I just think there were so many factors that went into last year, and none of them were age. It's one so of those things. It'll be, okay. it'll be like there's a few teams that will miss out, and a few teams will just mm. make it. You're in that same group with like us and a few other those sort of like Essendon, mm. Sydney type of teams. Well, I hope we're on Sydney's level next year. <laughs> That'll be all right. Uh, it depends how they go as well. But um, yeah. I, I, I just, I think we'll be fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, or whatever. Mm. I just think we're going to be too hard to beat at home again. Yeah. That's definitely true. I'm probably looking like a nuffy here. But I'm going to back that in. I just think we'll be okay. I think yeah. where things will could fall apart if we don't transition well is about two years from now. Mm. Uh, once Nick Nat goes. Uh, I think that's the real old shit moment. But yeah. at the moment, all the, all the pieces are still in place. You know, Because Nick Nat covers up a multitude of sins. Yeah, <laughs> sins. <laughs> that's an expression. He went, he went to Port Adelaide, mate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, no, I, I was agree. Hungry Jacks and it was Adelaide. <laughs> I agree with the premise of what you're saying, though. Uh, I don't know. I'm just optimistic, but we'll save that yeah. for another video. Let's have a little crack at a top four and bottom four for next year. So it's really hard not to just pick the same four again. Should we go with the top? Are we four going first? in order or no, just? Let's let's go bottom four first. Bottom four. Uh, pies. Pies. Yeah. So I think the pies are my pick for the wooden spoon. Yeah. To be honest, I wouldn't argue with it. I think uh, they've they've got a, a, a really exposed list now. Uh, with a lot of youngsters they're going to get games into and Dacos is going to be a big focal point of that next rebuild uh, and I think there'll be a good rebuild because I back Collingwood in they're a good club but uh, it's just not going to be a year where they play well I just yeah. don't think so other um, than them though I'm sort of s- struggling to pick a team with much confidence like because I even feel like North Melbourne the type teams can climb out of the bottom four yeah. Gold Coast is probably one I'll probably have to nominate I, say, I just have a four. bad feeling Gold Coast are going to be rubbish again mm. yeah I hate doing it, but it just yeah. feels like I don't see enough there to feel yeah. confident they get out of the top four sort of thing. Didn't Even see though enough. they do have the potential to. Didn't see enough improvement last yeah. year, I think. That's what it was. Um, and, you know, Matthew Rowell obviously making an underwhelming return to football. It's, it's a harsh thing to say about a kid because I, I, I actually think he's been unfairly hyped up yeah. more than he should, and it's put that pressure yeah. on him. But... There was at one point where Rao, when he was playing well, actually made Gold Coast a decent team. Yeah. Um, and that just hasn't come on in the way they expected. So, uh, losing Q Greenwood as well. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think they're in that bottom four. And another team I think will be there is Adelaide. I just think so much of their improvement last year was probably due to Tex Walker being on the end of some good work. You right. know, when he's kicking bags of five or six. Like, their start to the season, they were two and one, and he kicked like 16, 17 goals yeah. in that time. Uh, and then they faded away poorly. Like some of their worst football last year, Adelaide was really poor, uh, and some of their best football was good. They beat uh, Adelaide. Sorry, they beat Geelong and they beat Melbourne. But I think it's just going to be another year, like we said with Collingwood, where their list is still quite exposed. They're giving yeah. games to younger guys. Uh, I think another lean year for them. Hard to see the A graders emerging from the current crop as well. 
Yeah, that's right. Um, Till Fort maybe, but Eve's still a few years away. Probably. Yeah, I was going to say, just another kid is just too young to necessarily yeah. make that impact, I think. Um, two years away from being two years away. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Uh, any shout for the fourth bottom 14? Ooh, so who have we got? Collingwood? Uh, Collingwood, Gold Coast, Gold Coast and Adelaide. Um, I'm going to say the Saints. It's a bit of wow. A, yeah. That's a doozy. I was half expecting West Coast. No. <laughs> okay. Like I said, yous will be either in that just made or just missed finals, yeah. I think. But St. Kilda, I don't really see how they've improved no. in the trade period. No, but you probably argue they've underachieved last year. Or yeah. did they overachieve the year before? Yeah, I'm inclined t- to think they were better than what they showed last year. Mm. So I don't think they'll be in the bottom four. But crazy things have happened. It's not, yeah. the, not the worst shout. And it probably will be a team you would never expect. Uh-huh. And as much as I just hyped up West Coast... There is a chance it is us as well, mm. definitely. As much as I think we will make the eight, it, it's not crazy to think we'll be in the bottom four either. A general exercise would probably be interesting, sort of like getting each team sort of going, percentage chance of yeah. top four, four to eight. Yep. La, la, la. It'd be interesting, like, because Eagles would probably have, like, good percentages in, like, that five to eight. Yeah. And then lower probably in that middle, but then bottom four. Yeah, probably yeah. Probably a higher percentage in, like, just missing finals. Uh, all yeah. That sort of thing. I agree. The Eagles are one with a higher range. And you could say the same thing with St Kilda. Uh, Hawthorne's probably another team with a bit of a range. Uh, yeah, Hawks aren't a bad shout, actually. So they played some really good football in the second half of the year. Uh, but another team that's quite young. And yeah. a full pre-season with Sam Mitchell will be interesting to see if that leads to improvement or a bit yeah. of stagnation before it leads yeah. anywhere. It could be uh, some mixed results there. Uh, um, like a poor start of the season and strong finish again or something like that. I don't know. Uh, yeah. The one I wanted to say, but I can't because it probably won't happen, is Carlton. Yeah, that's the one I wanted to say. Well, oh, just because you don't like them, but yeah. not because you don't think they'll, they'll realistically actually... they'll do better than bottom four. But yeah, it's a possibility, but I don't think it'll happen. It is a possibility, but they'd have to get worse. Yeah, I don't know if they they would. Um, I'd fucking love it if they did. Yeah, I mean we can we can probably mention North Melbourne. They were the wooden spoons yeah, last mention year, them, but um, I, for some reason I'm just yeah. A bit but, bullish on them. Well, I when think. they've played some the, yeah. the quality of football that they did, and, and then their recruited list isn't like that bad. No, it's not. It's not. Uh, that being said, Cunnington out um, yeah. is a bit of a blow, and then they Tarrant retiring. Ta- or, uh, he's going to Richmond. Oh yeah, that's right, he left. Yeah. Um, and then some, you know, relying on a few older guys like Zebel. Yeah, yeah, there could be a little bit of transition there, but their best football was good. They've enough. turned Zebel and Holland into defenders, though. So yeah, that's, that's true. A factor. That's true. Yeah, uh, and they they do have a lot of players that are probably about to take that next step, which we'll get yeah. for, to as well with like Simkin, uh, you know, Simkin yeah, those two in particular, uh, Taron Thomas as well. Yep. Uh, but there, there is a chance they finish fourth last as well, yeah. and that wouldn't be too crazy. Wouldn't surprise me. What about top four? Are we going to lock in both grand finalists? I'll lock in Melbourne. I think you have to lock in Melbourne. The Bulldogs are just erratic. They're one of those ones that can fluctuate. Because it might sound silly for us to say, you know, the Bulldogs will miss the top four. But in the last, you know, well, seven years, yeah. where they've made two grand finals, they didn't make the top four once in that period. Yeah. They finished fifth this year. So they could be one other team that finishes the year in that sort of five to eight region, yeah. but then still go deep. Yeah. Um, so they're not a lock for the top four. I'll lock them for eight. That's what... Oh, I'm, yeah. You'd, you'd hope they made the eight, eight, to be honest. Yeah, but yeah, Melbourne, I'd probably... Port and Brizzy, probably yeah. they're the simple, just yeah. like... It's just hard to back against those guys, isn't it? Yeah, they're it? just established teams. Mm. Like, to go a quick NBA comparison, they're kind of like those Utah, Jazz, Denver type teams, but they're just mm. consistently good, but no one ever really consistently considers them... The premiership contenders yeah. yeah or the best team rather yeah yeah the more I sort of reflect on Port Adelaide the more I feel bridesmaid they just scream bridesmaid yeah. to me honestly yeah but it only takes one year where you're the best like yeah. it, in fact the 2004 premiership team was after like three years of being the best in the home yeah. and away and then falling away um, you've got to put yourself in the position to succeed and yeah. them and Brizzy are two teams that have definitely mm. been consistently for the past four years or so putting themselves in a position to win a flag they just haven't been able to yes get all the planets to quite align and the just the quality of youth of both Port Adelaide and Brisbane is compelling isn't it like when good. you're looking at a team to improve organically versus some of those other teams that are around that top four mark you know, Geelong in particular but just bring people in every um, year even the Bulldogs uh, I guess you got Norton who's still pre-peak but yeah. um, but I guess what I'm saying is like Butters and Dersmo and, and Rosie in particular the former two miss a lot of football yeah. so if those guys come in and play consistently then there's an argument that Port Adelaide improve even it sounds like Sam Powell Peppers 
coming in with a big year on his mind. Mm, yeah, you'd hope so. He went back to like training four weeks early. He was training with Is the first right? four years, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, Sounds like he's really committing to a big year. Hopefully he tanks this year, gets traded for a bargain, and then decides to excel. <laughs> Twice. Um, so Melbourne, Br- uh, Brisbane, and Port Adelaide are the three we're pretty confident about. Yeah. Uh, the Bulldogs are another good shout there. Um, I'm going to... We need a dark horse, though. I'm going a dark horse, spicy direction here, GWS. Yeah, I, li- I like that in terms of the logic. Yeah, they've um, got they've still got all the list talent in the world. I think a lot relies on Hogan, though, mm. to be honest. I think the difference between him playing a full season... We saw some really yeah. good signs from him last year. Multiple four-goal games. That's yeah, cool. and if he produces that for 20 games a year, not four goals yeah. a game, but if he produces a 45 to 50 goal season, yeah. I think that improves him quite a lot. Especially with Toby Rain coming back in after his suspension. Yeah. He's yeah. another avenue to goals. That's a good point. That's a good point. So that's five weeks. The first five rounds he's missing, right? Yeah. That's a critical first mm. five rounds, to be honest. It'll be interesting to see what the fixture is because... Yeah. That'll make or break up. Yeah, yeah. But they did just beat Sydney in the final. So yeah. there's reason to believe that they should be confident. And the Swans, actually, we didn't even mention mm. there as a chance for yeah. top four. You'd have to say They're so. a chance, but yeah. I'd probably put them in that five to eight or just missing out because they have that yeah. slight down year before they really yep. are there. Is it too early for Essendon? For top four, yeah. Mm. Yeah. They need Cox, Perkins, and Reid to really yeah. be driving that for them to make top four, I think. Mm. Because yeah, I think they do have close to maxed out most of the talent they have on uh, that team. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of upside there in terms of their youth. It just, I think it's probably a little bit early. And yeah. I think their finals performance where they belt in week one shows they're not quite as close to that level yet. Yeah. But they were, a good t- they were a good team at times this year. Mm. So I think it's probably another year for Essendon. Um, where Sydney, Sydney's yeah. a bit hard to predict, hey? Yeah. Like, I could see them missing. But I could see them, I could see them top four. Top four, definitely. Yeah. Uh, Their brand of football is so impressive. Mm. Um, uh, but yeah, we, we don't have a crystal ball. so If only. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's, before we finish the pod, nominate a few uh, breakout players that we f- uh, anticipate next year. Mentioned him before. LD is probably a good one. He was a highly rated pick mm-hmm. when he was taken. He hasn't really hit his straps, but he's sort of shown flashes. But mm-hmm. this with this consistent, like with a full pre-season, this could be the year he reaches that consistent level yep who um, else do I like uh, I think Cam Rain is worth a mention for yeah. a player that missed last year with an ACL last year was meant to be his big year yeah. uh, I think he did pretty well in the preseason game right before he did his ACL if I'm not mistaken um, and it kind of reminds me when Petrarca got like 38 in a preseason game yeah. and people were like oh my god is he actually a decent player and, and look where he is now um, it'd be interesting to see how he recovers from that yeah. but I think he's worth a mention um Ooh. Isaac Quainor, I'm a fan of. Yeah. I think I think he could take the next step next year. Yeah. Ja, ja Caldwell. Yeah, Caldwell's not a bad shout. So he, uh, he he looked really good at times last year or this year yeah. rather. When, before and he's he that bigger mid that I was sort of alluding to before Freston, and he can play that role. Yeah, is he that big? He's like I high eighties, like, I think. Is he? Okay. He's pretty solid. Right. Um either way, just a very good player, to be honest. Uh, uh, I think he played some really good football for Essendon before he got injured. Um and in that sort of age bracket as well, where he's got a few pre-seasons under his belt, where it's uh, it's not inconceivable that he could actually improve them. Uh, Matty Rowell. Yeah, Rowell. That's more of a comeback. Noah Anderson, probably more comeback, so. Comeback, but he's only played like 10 games total. So uh, you have to say that it is kind of a breakout. But I get what you mean. Uh, he's already... What, people like, know how good he is. He's just got yeah, to get back to it. I suppose you're I right. think Anderson's probably the better breakout candidate because he sort of had a steady year last year. Mm. But now he's got the chance to build on it. He could do a Tweak Miller and um, be consistent. Because yeah. his output when he was playing well was like 30 plus yeah, posies yeah. and stuff. Uh, but that's true. And a lot of people, when it was both of them almost rated Anderson higher than Raul. Some people did. Yeah. Like yeah, right. I don't, I don't know if Anderson ever produced the performances that Raul did, but yeah. uh, it was only like four games. But people so. saw like the different traits of Anderson, probably saw up some yeah. potential with They it. complement each other well yeah. because they're quite different. Um, anyone from your own club you'd like to nominate? Who's a player that you're excited to see hit his straps? Hayden Young. Yeah. It's probably the safe, easy option. Like, he's yeah. healthy, give him a full preseason. He's arguably the best kick in the league. Yeah. Yep. He's just such a point of difference. Even there is talk of him playing a little more in the midfield. Mm. Even though I'm happy with him off half back, just yeah. hitting targets. I was going to say, I don't know. I feel like you'd be 
it's certainly robbing Peter to pay Paul when you've when you I think halfbacks a really important position. Yeah. There's probably other guys that are fighting for those halfback spots who I'd rather try and yeah. push in the midfield. It's not as though you're lacking in midfielders. Yeah, like Tucker's probably one they tried to play him back last year, but it's not him, so yeah. he's getting another crack at the midfield. Valenti even he's had his ups and downs. Yeah, yeah. He's one we rate internally, but he hasn't gotten that chance. Yeah. Will Brody even's pushing for one of those spots. That's true. Yeah, there's a bit of midfield uh depth i guess yeah. uh in terms of players you'd want to probably try in the midfield before hayden young yeah um uh, but yeah interesting um a player from west coast that i don't think will necessarily be good enough to get recognized league wide but may may sort of come on like a bit of a josh rotham type get that internal sort of respect or yeah. wa like local respect yeah on the west I, coast i'm hopeful it's luke foley I'll nominate a player that's not just drafted. It's easy for me to say Campbell Chesser yeah. or Greg Clark. Yeah, that I was trying to avoid like this year's yeah, draft. That's right, one, yeah. yeah. But Luke Foley, I think, uh, in the opportunities he had at AFL level was really, really good for us. Yeah. Um, in, the, in particular against Richmond, I think he had like high 20s. I think he had like 21 in, a, in the first half and it was one of his first few yeah. games. So um, I'm hoping yeah. he can be that Brad Shepard yeah. replacement. Cool. All right, that's about all the football we've got for today. Um, we have the Ashes coming up in two days, Busher. Spicy. Uh, you are you hotly captain? anticipating that? I'll probably flick. It's one of those things I'll have it on and like, catch it. Like I don't sit there and just watch the yeah. whole game. Well, I can't do that. I'm can... thinking of embracing it a bit more for content purposes, though. Yeah. Um, I don't know how I don't know how look. you'd stream Ashes, though, unless you're just going to do like probably eight hours. probably stream a session, session, to be honest. I just say uh, yeah. Not that kind yet. of session. I mean, I'm watching the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stream an absolute session, bro. Oh, fuck yeah. Um, that's kind of actually what a few streams have been, to be honest, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, but yeah, apparently we're widely considered to potentially go 5-0. <laughs> um, what? The Poms are in shambles, are they? Yeah, there's people saying that on my stream. I'm very, very casual. Uh cricket watcher now I got into the World Cup and I will get into the Ashes but uh, yeah despite this Tim Payne situation um, yeah. we are heavy favourites and Paddy Cummins yeah. uh, gets the nod as captain which interesting is interesting cool. with the bowler as captain there's always a bit it's of conjecture it's the first time I've ever remembered yeah. it actually I don't, I don't remember another time I've heard there's conjecture around like having bowlers as a captain because people think they can get in like one on one battles and shit and just like mm. if they like really want to bowl someone out, they think they'll just keep calling their own name to the dead yeah. team, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I suppo- That's is the that, argument I've heard against bowlers being captains. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. It, it, there has been bowler captains in the past, just not of Australia. I don't yeah. think I remember. I'm sure it's happened, but uh, I started watching cricket when Steve Waugh was captain. Before him was Alan Border, yeah. uh, and I'm blurry on who it was before that. Toby uh, Taylor uh, or something. Oh, Mark Taylor might in between yeah. Adam yeah. Alan Border. So uh, you're right, it was Mark Taylor. Yeah. So yeah, um, it's interesting. Toby Taylor, mate. Tubby Tubby. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Get it right. Uh, I do remember when Michael Clark was captain. I, I feel like he underbowled himself. I feel like yeah. he was actually a pretty good bowler. Um, mm. But I think he had back is- issues anyway. Yeah. Um, but England have their own scandal at the moment with uh, this racism scandal that's going on oh, through shit. there. The, I've yeah, the, heard about this. Yeah, there's like a, a former player coming out and alleging that these players through the 90s and well, not 90s, maybe 2000s. Uh, there was like a racist culture, which you can believe probably mm. considering that time. Yeah. Um, what was it, like Carberry or something? No, it wasn't Carberry. It was, uh, I think it's Rafiq. It's just, yeah. Forgive me if I've got that na- name wrong because I don't actually remember yeah. him as a player. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think, I think Pakistani English. I, I, I guess, yeah, player. England, there's a lot of Indian Pakistani yeah. people, so there probably is that sub element of racism yeah yeah point. yeah there was yeah. uh i won't repeat everything that was in that article but i read but uh yeah it's uh they're in serious shit yeah. in terms of um was it more like culture. islamophobic or anti like, like uh, general? not islamophobic yeah. it was just uh just being ignorant yeah. you know dumb, um, full, dumb shit yeah yeah it's not unlike you know the collingwood eddie yeah. mcguire thing to be honest so okay, um, yeah. there's just controversy everywhere at the moment um mm. and tim payne's by comparison i don't think is as bigger deal yeah. to be honest so um but he, I, I think tim payne's a bigger deal than what steve smith was steve smith the whole steve smith thing <laughs> yeah. just to rehash that from two or three years ago it was a mountain yeah. made out of a molehill like any other captain did that shit would have been like a two-game suspension yeah that well, that was cricket australia who yeah. decided to take that on and yeah but that's yeah, just because and that was all just pure media driven mm. like they just wanted to push a narrative like mm. If you look at the context of world cricket, that shit... I wouldn't say mm. par for the course, but it's no, no. common enough where it's not... I agree. Like, an egregious ethical sort of thing. It's like, uh, Yeah, I agree. And it's... it's Copy a two-game suspension or whatever, yeah, fair cop. But yeah, it's it's different to actual cheating, I believe. Yeah. I honestly believe that. And this is from a guy who doesn't even care that much about cricket. I'm not saying this because I'm Australian. I just don't think, you know, sandpaper on a ball is... a 
massive deal. Like, yeah. I agree, it, it should be penalised, but yeah. we are on a tangent now. But uh, I agree, yeah. The, it is a bigger deal, this, comparatively to the, what Steve Smith did. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. I actually saw Cam Bancroft the other day at Bunnings. Yep. Nice. And I was like, don't say anything about sandpaper being an R16. <laughs> 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 it's not the first time I've seen him there. Yeah. And uh, the joke comes to mind, but I'm like, he would probably Too punch soon. me. Yeah. Too soon. <laughs> oh, it's <that's> weird. <laughs> um, but yeah, looking forward to the, the Ashes and we'll probably do some streams and stuff like that as well. Yeah. So uh, hopefully we have a win. A bit of big um, bash even. Yeah, yeah. We've said that for years now. We've never yeah. done it. So um, yeah, that's right. When did Perth play? I'm not too sure. Yeah, who knows? Who I've lost track of big bash. Like, I used to be It started last night. Yeah, I yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. I used to be reasonably into it, but yeah. I've sort of... So I used to be spend more time at Rotto and it'd just be on each other. So I'd yeah. watch every game and sort of know enough about the league and feel informed to betting on it and do mm. pretty well. So that's probably why I got into it a bit. My approach to cricket is that I just watch it every summer and then forget every single detail I learned <laughs> that summer by yeah. next year. <laughs> forget yeah. who's the captain. But yeah, a bit different at football. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, that is uh, that is it for True Footy Podcast 84. Um, oh. Yeah, but that's the football dried up for the season. This is officially the off-season now. As far as I'm concerned, it's after the draft is the off-season. So. Yeah, we get that pre-season to just mm. take it easy. Yeah, yeah. I've been doing very little in terms of YouTube over the last month. Um, yeah, it's been great, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. I am a burnt out to a crisp, uh, so I'm going to enjoy the summer. But we'll still be around and doing doing yep. streams and stuff Smash like that. a few things. Yeah, gross. <laughs> cool. All right, thank you guys for watching and listening, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Cool, Baines.